Right. Uh, this, this talk is about a bit of code which I've been working on for the last, I mean, on and off for the last six months or so, of some new uh, code for putting together menus and toolbars, that, that's sort of part of the user interface of GTK applications. It's currently residing in a, li in a library called Dibeg, which we are using as for prototyping of stuff. Uh, hope that in the future, it's going to be, um, it'll probably move down down to another library, but it's it's in the design phase at the moment. Um, in the talk, uh, first we're going to be talking a bit about uh, just generally what uh, Libeg is, then uh, move on to some information about the development process we are using in GNOME now and some of the reasons for those changes. Um, then after that, uh, take a bit of a look at the Libeg API and hopefully it will give some idea of why why you might want to use this API rather than the existing uh, menu and toolbar APIs in GTK. All right. Uh, yeah, this is sort of a, a general API which can can be used to handle both the menus and toolbars. So, uh, unlike the existing ones, which uh, we've got separate API to interfaces to put together your menus and your toolbars and it, this will all integrate nicely together, which is quite nice. And yeah, it's and it's in the prototype stage at the moment. Uh, it's unless something weird, uh, something goes wrong, it'll probably be landing in uh, the GTK 2.4 library, which there isn't any release date set on at the moment. But that might be about six months or so. Um, hmm. uh, the uh, the GNOME development uh, process has changed a lot in, in, since the 1.0 release. Uh, when we were when we were developing uh, GNOME one, uh, early GNOME, uh, development basic was basically just whatever each developer was most interested in at the time, and uh, we did not. Um, so basically, if you found if there was some particular thing which you were interested in, it was it would basically it would go in and that was it. There was not really any review or anything, and <coughs> things could change from week to week. This is all before 1.0. Uh, uh, there was the GNOME 1.0 release, which many people probably remember was not all that stable. The main stable thing in it was that it was the first time we were um, uh, putting in some guarantees of binary compatibility of the development platform you'll find that most applications which you would, might compile against GNOME 1.0 would run on a GNOME 1.4 system. Or if you've got the development libraries, you can run them on a, on a 2.0 system. Uh, the main thing for GNOME 1.x, we were really only providing uh, backward compatibility um, guarantees. Uh, New APIs, new interfaces would sometimes be added from version to version, sometimes good ones, sometimes they were pretty trivial things which mainly caused headaches for people, but we sort of tightened that up quite a bit in the 2.0, uh, 2.x series, where in a minor series, uh, in, everyone knows what I mean by minor series, sort of like 2.0, 2.2, that sort of thing, where we try to keep to just uh, sticking to forward and, and backward binary compatibility so that a program which is compiled against uh, GNOME, the GNOME libraries 2.0.5 will run on 2.0.1 and modulo any sort of big big bug uh, big bugs which you might rely on the fixes for. Um, so yeah, there probably won't be any big new features in GNOME 2.0 as Jeff was saying in a couple of talks ago, 2.2 uh, is right around the corner, and it's uh, it's going to be backwards compatible with 2.0, so it should be easy to move up to it. A much much easier job than uh, moving moving to 2.0 from the one uh, known one platform. Uh, yeah, in before before 1.0, we had. Lots of people with the uh, lots of people with check-in per, uh, permissions, and there wasn't much of a culture of peer review or anything. So 
we ended up with uh, a lot of the stuff, I mean, some of the stuff which you can see today in today's known libraries was around back then, and that was the good stuff. There's also a lot of bad stuff which is gone now, and where it's really good that it's gone. Um, yeah, it was, it was back then. It was good enough to to write a lot of the GNOME desktop on, but I I would not have recommended anyone use it to write applications outside of that because I mean, I suppose in a way it's it's similar to the kernel where they've they've got internally they've got APIs which are not very stable. They they've got a they've got enough control over the over the entire code base to be able to upgrade sort of users of an API when it changes. Uh, but um, it's not really, some of those internal APIs you wouldn't recommend for outside code to use. That's, um, yeah. In, yeah. Uh, we removed a fair bit of the uh, hard to maintain stuff in 1.x, but we also left a lot of it because it, they, we, by the time we got to that stage, we were getting applications outside, outside of the core desktop using it. Um, and it worked out pretty well, but uh, yeah, there was, I mean, there's still a bit of uh, bad stuff left in the 1.x platform, but I'll give an example of that uh, in a sec. Uh, 2.x platform, the main, the main driver of that was the upgrade of GTK 2.0 because, which added a lot of features and uh, it included a lot of cleanups as well. Um, at first, we were going to do a minimal upgrade of the GNOME development platform, uh, not break, uh, so it would have just been changed just enough to uh, to get everything working on the new version of GTK, but um, along the line, people realized this would be a really good, a really good time to fix up our own APIs and there was a lot of a lot of API changes for 2.0, which did set back the release. Um, it depends on your point of view of whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, it meant that 2.0 is is better than it could have been, and better than it might have been. Uh, but it also, but then we probably would have got to this stage just with a different version number if we'd released earlier. Um, as I've been, I mean, you've probably seen with as as we've been moving to the newer versions, uh, we've got the more stability guarantees. It's also mean means that it's been more difficult to develop new new code because uh, basically every API starts off um, in a, a sort of early development stage where you will you will have problems, design problems, and you don't really want those things to go directly into the development platform. So we've, um, there's been a number of different uh, procedures which have been introduced to, I mean, uh, to, to help. Uh, there's been a number of uh, new procedures which have been introduced to help introduce the uh, new, uh, introduce uh, new features without having to worry about uh, Making the main development platform unstable. Uh, just as an example of what we had before GNOME 1.0, does everyone know Bowie? Uh, okay, that's that's a quote which from one of his posts on uh, GNOME GUI list, I think. Um, yeah, it took uh, about two days. Um, Someone had implemented it and put it into the uh, library, so that's that's about the level of peer review for some of the new feature, some of the features we had back then. Um, um, basically, the way you'd create one of these things was you just pass in a color object, a, a structure giving the color, and that would be it. Um, he probably wouldn't have passed muster for GNOME 2.0. Um, Here's some of the problems. Uh, there's obvious usability issues. I mean, with the way uh, the way it was intended to be used, these GNOME lamps would be for all, used to display all kinds of information, and they all look pretty much the same. So it's not clear what it does or what you can do with it. 
can you click on it? Can you? <laughs> There's internationalization problems. Uh, different uh, different cultures associate different meanings with different colors, and they've got this interface where you specify a color, and it'll and which is does not really. Uh, yes. Was it like a status bar? Kind of colors, uh, uh, that's that's got uh, four num and. That's got four known lamps next to each other, so. Uh, it's, yeah, it was sort of, it could be anything. <laughs> um, sounded like a good idea at the time, uh, so. Um, well, that's what the usability list is for. Um, but uh, also, we've got. I mean, it's sort of you can, and new people can still come in and in introduce new ideas, and it's just it's not going to go into the development platform two days later. Now, um, we we'll want to actually, and we've got a number of people who. We're all, we're all a lot, are much better at writing desktop environments than we were five years ago, so, or four, four or five years ago, um, which does help. And we've got uh, experts from Sun and Zimian and every, other places. So there are people who know about the accessibility issues. I mean, the internationalization team, the GNOME, is sort of a lot uh, much better developed than it was. So, and they're not afraid to tell you that. What you've done makes their job um, very difficult. So, um, and sort of, I and mean, we we don't sort of close ourselves to new ideas completely. But yeah, we'll uh, we investigate them more. Uh, although I think uh, Bowie ended up getting uh, banned from some of the lists. Uh, from he just uh, it's Bowie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there was also another interface there, which was where well, you could give a number of constants, uh, which is a bit better for the internationalization because you could uh, you could customize it to um, use colors which uh, you could use colors which were appropriate for the locale. But I don't think any of the few uses of GNOME LAMP ever actually used it, um, and the accessibility problems. Uh, only and if you've got the bit of information, only providing it through color is going to cut your user base. Uh, there's people who are fully blind who won't be able to use it. There's color blind people, so you're going to have to provide the information in some other form, and that other form may be sufficient without the thing. Uh, yeah, there are better ways of doing it. Um, but if you don't know about Bowie, there's sort of a bit of his history at that that uh, URL down the bottom. Uh, in uh, GTK2, one of the one of the new interfaces we added was uh, a new tree widget, which it was one of the first things which was using some of these new development procedures. It was not developed, even though it shipped in GTK2. The initial design didn't occur within the GTK library. Um, uh, it was all developed outside, and it went through a design procedure looking at Existing, existing alternatives like what Qt did, what uh, Swing did, etc., and ended up with a, a prototype implementation. Yes. It is similar to the job. It's, it's it's similar to the Swing interface. I mean, it's got similar ideas. The interface is not identical, but they're actually looking at. Providing something which is simpler because the swing tree interface is actually fairly complicated, and we found that even though the tree widget we've got handles everything we want, in a lot of cases it requires more code than, especially beginner programmers, uh, they get they get intimidated by it. But that's that's something which is getting improved. It'll probably also some of those changes will probably also go through a similar process to um, to how this was added. Uh, so um, the design issues with, within the API were um, were sort of all looked at on the mailing lists. 
when that was fixed, um, they moved it into GTK. It wasn't bug free at that stage, but we could be fairly certain that we had a good AP, uh, a good interface which we would be able to support. Okay, onto the bit which the talk's actually about. Um, uh, existing menu and toolbar APIs in GTK, uh, they've got a few problems where you, if you're writing a large program, you'll probably need a fair bit of code sitting on top of it uh, aimed to handle all your features. Uh, there is another API in Bonobo for handling uh, menus and toolbars, which also handles things, uh, handles uh, adding menus from a uh, an embedded uh, component or something. But in a way, that has been more harmful than good because it meant that we've a lot of uh, GNOME applications, for instance, started off as GTK applications. When those people want to upgrade to uh, use GNOME, at one stage we were saying we should switch to the Bonobo API, which in essence meant uh, rather than just adding a few features to make your application, make use of the GNOME stuff, you'd end up rewriting bits of the application. So what we want, we want, it's become apparent, we want a new API in GTK which uh, can support the needs of larger applications should be simple enough for small applications so that everyone will use it and should be extendable so that something like Bonobo could use it in the future. Um, I don't know whether it will, but um, we want to leave that door open. Um, yeah, the code for creating uh, menus uh, is, is fairly simple at the moment. This is the existing toolbar API. You first create a menu bar across the top. You add menu items for things like file menu and edit menu, etc. You add menus, uh, those are menu items. You add a submenu underneath each one, which will pop down when you click on the menu item. Then you add menu items inside the menus, which you can then select. After that, you add callbacks to each of the, each of the menu items. It's fairly, it's fairly simple. and does what you'd expect. Uh, there's also a, an interface called GTK Item Factory, which can simplify that work quite a bit. But it's still essentially doing the same thing. Um, for toolbars, there's a similar but slightly different API. And but, uh, there's nothing like Item Factory for it. Um, the problems are with that is that um, what you've, what you've written in your code, that pretty much defines what the menus will look like. If at some point um, you realize that the menu structure is quite bad, which oh, I mean, since we've got the usability team and stuff, um, they actually do some testing and they might find that it would be a lot better if you got all your menus some other way uh, in some other location. You end up having to go through and uh, modify all of that code and it can introduce bugs and it's just something it would be nicer if you didn't have to do. Um, uh, the other thing, in a lot of uh, more complex applications, there's more than one way of performing a certain, uh, an action. Uh, the common one you'll see in an Office application is that you've got the file menu with new, open, save, etc., and you'll have the same things on the toolbar. At the moment, let's say that um, you've just opened a document and you haven't made any modifications, you want to disable the save option. In the existing menu API, you'll have to find the widget for the save save menu item and disable that, then do the same on the toolbar and disable it. Um, and it doesn't handle things like uh, menu merging, which is something used in component systems like Bonobo and there's also, um, you'll see, You'll see things on, certain things on Windows, like Microsoft Office doing that as well. Um, so one of, the, one of the big changes is the introduction of uh, objects, which we call actions. These, these are basically represent any user action. Um, so that's things like uh, opening a file, saving the file, and opening a new document. It's, not actually a menu item, not actually a toolbar button. It'll include a callback to um, to fire when that action gets performed. 
It'll include things like the label you'd have in the menu item. Maybe you might also include a shorter label to include on a toolbar button. Uh, it have, might have a stock icon to put next to the menu item and put on the toolbar. And the important thing is it includes some state information such as whether the, whether the action is visible, whether the, uh, whether, uh, the action is, can be, is enabled or disabled and things like that. Uh, the action then knows how to, uh, there is, there is a, an, a function which you can call to uh, produce a menu item which will represent that action and a similar, another one to produce a toolbar button. And so that means whenever you, whenever you uh, click on the menu item for the action, it will call the action. If you, if you change the label on the action, it will update the menu item. If you set the action to being disabled, it will disable the menu item, etc. So this can simplify that. This can simplify those sort of things. Yes. Uh, Not not in the not in the current code we've got, but that would be a very simple modification. I mean, uh, some of the I mean, this idea of actions is not a new idea, by the way. Um, there's a similar idea in in Qt and Java, and uh, you can tell that they must be using something like that in a lot of proprietary applications and and other frameworks. Um, like I think in Java, you can you can call you can actually pass an action object to the constructor for a button and you'll have a button which activates the action and gets its text and everything from the action. Uh, one of the other, oh sorry, Jeff? Um, how are you integrating the menu tag? Yeah. I haven't written any of that code yet, but uh, it'll be, the way it'll probably work is there's a couple of ATK objects for a, and peers for the action objects, and you would see a relation from the ATK object for the menu item or toolbar button, uh, which sort of says give a relation to the uh, to the action objects. Um, that code hasn't been written, but it's probably going to be fairly straightforward. Uh, ATK is the accessibility toolkit, which is one of the new things in. Uh, GTK 2.0. It's basically a bridge between, right, the accessibility stuff in GTK 2 is fairly complex. There's this ATK interface which is for applications to provide information about their structure. Uh, then there's another thing called ATSPI which is a bridge which grabs that information from the application and provides it through a CORBA interface. And then you have tools like a screen reader or a magnifier, which can then use the CORBA interface to find out the state of the current, currently, currently active application and maybe either magnify the area around the focus or do whatever, whatever else. Um, yeah, last, the last point on this slide is that uh, you can have multiple types of actions. So the standard action is just one you click on. Um, uh, the next one you've got uh, check, uh, sort of the equivalent of a, ch a check menu item or a check button. So we've got a check action, and that one will, so it's got an on-off state with it as well. And that that state will be mirrored by any of the any of the menu items or or uh, toolbar buttons for that for that action. I'll just quickly give a demonstration. Oops. Okay. This is a very simple one. Um, there's a couple of menus and got a couple of, a couple of toolbar buttons. Um, uh, this so we've got one here, which is a bold action. That's, that's actually the icon for bold face. So if I click on that, let's say check action. And you can see down here that the 
uh, bold items being checked when I, so that's sort of mirroring the state between those two. And if I click on that one, it's unchecked the toolbar button. And similarly, you can have a set of a set of mutually exclusive actions. So this is sort of like radio buttons, which you can also see on the menu. And uh, got a uh, we've got another action here which says disable cut and paste up. So this one's got a uh, this action's got a callback attached to it, which will then go and um, set the sensitive state for a number of the other actions to disabled. So click on that, and I can't click on these ones anymore. So yeah. Uh, Uh, generally, an application, uh, this is just a test application to demonstrate uh, some of the capabilities. I just, I haven't done that in this test application. Um, I, uh, usually, it's, um, you're going to be programmatically enabling or disabling actions. It's not really, I mean, you'll, you'll do that kind of thing in relation, in, in response to some other form of user, user uh, input. Uh, the other stuff you can see, I've got two bold items here, and they're dis displaying the same keyboard shortcut next to them. That's sort of, uh, if I actually had uh, modifiable keyboard accelerators turned on, which I don't actually at the moment, if I change the keyboard accelerator for bold, you'd actually see both items change at once. So you can do things like that. That's a fairly simple, a a fairly simple example. Okay. Um, generally, the, when you've in a large application, you, you're going to actually group a number of these app, these actions together. Uh, this is this is grouping by what what sort of what context the actions actually make sense in. So often you might have a set of actions which are, in, which should always be available, and they make sense in all state. So, like, that might be options like to quit the application, to create a new window, to open a new document, and things like that. Uh, you might have another act, uh, another set of actions which um, act on the current document. So that's things like saving a document. And let's say you've got a word processor. You might have, um, when you're editing a table, you might have yet more actions which uh, are only only makes sense when you're in that particular mode. So uh, you can group together the actions like this, and uh, that's sort of used in the uh, menu merging, which I'll get on onto later. Uh, in the simplest case, you might just have a single group of actions, and more complex ones, like, like what I've described above, you'll have multiple ones. OK. Um, there is a number of the other toolkits which only have this action concept. They don't have uh, menu merging. Um, like I believe that uh, the Qt library has um, this concept of actions in it, but uh, they've got a menu merging implementation which is implemented at a, at a higher level for their K Office uh, suite. And uh, I think I, and Java also has the actions concept but doesn't have merging, unless I've missed it. Uh, so the idea of this is that we grab um, two sort of menu layouts, and we want to merge them together. And hopefully later on, we'll demerge them so that uh, and get back to the original state. Uh, so we we sort of set up a tree which represents um, the state of the I mean, the structure of the menus. Uh, and it, each of the nodes is is represented by an action, uh, an action name, actually. That's, that's one thing I forgot to mention. Yeah, all the actions have names, like, in which you can refer to them by. Um, at each node, you've got a, uh, you'll specify an action name, which it will, it, it would call. Uh, we described the, uh, uh, for the main interfaces for this, we describe the structure of the menus by with an XML file. At the moment, I'm using a subset of the Bonobo uh, 
menu merging XML files, but we've removed all the translatable strings from the uh, UI file so that they're provided by the action objects, which uh, the translators like because it's one less thing to I mean, it's one less thing to worry about. Here's an example where we might have two, uh, two user interface files uh, which uh, describe, a, describe a set of menus. Um, uh, so you can see um, there's the root element and then you've got the menu is the menu bar, a set of submenus, you've got a placeholder which I'll get back to later, and and you've got doc item, which is the name the Bonobo except the Bonobo format uses for toolbars. And then we've got another one which is similar. We've actually got a submenu underneath the placeholder. And when you merge them together, you would end up with this. Um, we actually also keep uh, reference counts on the nodes so that uh, it keeps track of the fact that um, that we've got two user uh, two user interface files which have. Uh, which have referenced the root node, the menu node, the placeholder one, etc. As you can see, um, it's added a couple of extra menu, it menu items underneath the open menu item. Uh, you can probably guess that if I merge them in the other order, you actually get a slightly different order. So that actually matters, and it's a bit hard to get around that in some cases. Most, uh, uh, yes. Uh, you'd be able to load, um, you could probably have, have them as a string within the application, but quite often you'd want to have them uh, as a separate file. I mean, it's most applications will have some data files anyway, um, so you may as well have them as a separate file, and also it means that people can actually experiment with uh, some of the user interface. Um, the other thing which people want to do with these kind of things is to add support for menu editing in applications. So that's one of the areas where you want to have these things separate. Okay. Um, yeah. The as I was saying, the the merging process works on on the idea of the node names. So that if you've got two nodes of the same name, then in the in the combined menu, they uh, they end up. Uh, that'll they'll, uh, be represented by the same node, and as I said, you get a reference count, which is used in the demerging process. Uh, one thing which sometimes trips people up is the fact that uh, you really want to put names on your separators because otherwise you end up with just a single separator in each menu. Uh, and uh, the new nodes are just appended to their parent container, which um, which is usually okay. Uh, there's the idea of placeholders, which sort of acts like a, which allow you to place extra menu items or something in the middle of a menu. Uh, that's sort of, that's used where like if you've got a large application, you might have uh, the top level menu bar, your menus at the start, so file, edit, and standard ones like that, have a placeholder for extra menu items and then help on the end. That's what I had in the previous example. Um, so you, you can see that in this instance, the placeholder doesn't actually show up in the user interface, but it's just helped um, place that menu in the middle. Okay. Um, oh, I'll just, uh, I've got an example of, of the menu merging. Okay, this is another another one. Uh, we've actually got three uh, menu merge uh, files. Uh, you can actually, I can, I can get a, a dump of the, I'll just, okay, um, if I do, if I just press on the dump tree, I get a, I get a list of of everything which is in the user interface file, which is a basically the uh, the node tree, I can go and demerge part of the user interface uh, tree, and you'll lose some of the things and get a dump of that. 
you can see the place a placeholder here which is uh, empty pretty much that's just sitting between the edit and the help menus here and adding it back in I get the extra menu item and the extra top level menu between those uh, and if you if you get rid of all of them then it's gone and you'll see if I what I was saying before about them uh, uh, the order in which you merge does uh, does make a difference so I'll, I ended up with a different order there uh, Uh, I would, in your average application, you'd never remove all of your menus. Um, it's generally you've got a base set of menus and you're trying to add extra features depending on your mode. So that, I mean, generally you've, you've always got that base, uh, use, base bit of user interface there and you're overlaying extra things which will add extra menu items inside a placeholder or, or whatever. Um, uh, I don't know if this is going to be usable for the panels and vFolder stuff. Uh, which, so, which sort of thing? We, I mean, the, I, I thought that was still going to be using basic. Uh, that's probably going to still be using different code, which uh, just does a dump of a uh, the of the VFS stuff, isn't it? Or? Yeah, sorry, the, the actual menu items themselves. Oh, you mean sort of. As I was saying, I, I don't know whether the panel is um, going to be the best in, uh, is going to be using this sort of thing because it's that's that's a fairly different type of menu. I'd say uh, you sort of know what I. <laughs> you just. <laughs> okay. Um, in the future, one of the things which we still got to add is uh, you probably. Um, we've got to have an interface for adding some dynamic menu items and stuff because not everything you can describe in your XML file one of the often you'll want to be I mean, even if it's just sort of a bit hackish sometimes you'll be wanting to just add an extra item directly to the menus which we need an API to do that Hope we'll get, get something which is hopefully better than Bonobo because at the moment for that you've got to basically use SNPrintf to put together a little bit of XML and then pass that to the library and well, often pass it to a Corver interface which will then decode it and it's pretty ugly. Uh, we've got to, um, at the moment we've got a the prototype implementation, we need to write up a design document for it which will kick off the review process um, on which will happen on GTK Devel list. That's, Wait, really waiting till I've got a bit enough time to get that done. We've currently got a few people who have um, who are using this uh, this API, just testing it. Um, has anyone heard of Vista Project? Um, so some of the Swedes have got a branch of that, which will uh, which uses this API. Um, so hopefully, you get more users and find out what's uh, working, what's broken in it. Uh, if you're interested in, I mean, back on at the start about the GNOME development process, uh, you want to look at the uh, GEPS. Um, if you want the code for um, uh, the menu stuff, it's currently in the libeg module of GNOME CVS. Uh, that's that's pretty much all I've got at the moment. Uh, is there any questions? Yes. Uh, 
Right. As I was saying about the uh, API stability thing, um, we've released GNOME 2. GNOME 3, there is no there is no plan for it at the moment. It's it might happen in a few years, but nothing nothing in GNOME 2 is going to go away until GNOME 3. That's one of the things uh, in the development platform. Yeah, Jeff can remove whatever he wants from the desktop. Um, uh, so that's still going to be there. It's still going to have to be supported. Uh, often, often we've sort of found better ways of doing things, and the way you handle that is you end up having to support two APIs until you at a point where you can remove the old API. So this is going to be a an extra one. Uh, it'll it'll be it'll uh, hopefully the Bonobo things will be deprecated uh, eventually. I've got to get uh, Michael to take a look at some. He's a big Bonobo hacker. Get him to take a look at some of this because while I think I've got stuff set up so that he'd probably be able to hook in a lot of the Bonobo stuff, it's, there's probably some stuff I've missed. Um, so again, that's sort of the uh, design review, which um, I, we've only had a little bit of that so far. Um, any other questions? When I'm right, when I'm talking about design review here, I'm, I'm sort of this is sort of the uh, developers. Uh, this is sort of design review on the eight, on the user interface. As far as usability goes, that sort of this particular bit of code has no user interface other than what's already there. So, in that particular and in, in that particular case, there is not as much of a need for the usability side and uh, of review. But there is a separate there is a usability team in GNOME which uh, which we actually get a lot of the input on uh, when we're looking at uh, new widgets or extensions to existing widgets. Uh, yes. Are you looking forward to the get? Uh, I've already done one get, so uh, one of the things I probably wasn't wasn't all that visible uh, uh, in this in this other one. We're actually using a different toolbar widget from the standard GTK one, which this is sort of an extension. Oh, don't know what happened there. Uh, this is a new toolbar widget which is handling the overflow of menu item of uh, items on the toolbar, which nicer than what the current GTK toolbar does. Uh, already done, yeah. Basic. Yes, I can actually get to those menu those toolbar buttons on on the end. Uh, that one, so I've I've done one, so <laughs> just got to do another. Uh, Yes, I reckon gaps are good, even if some people don't. Is there a, is there a mechanism for doing like bash menus dropping down from the toolbar? Like, uh, uh, it's basically right with this new toolbar, um, which I've got, which I wasn't the subject of this talk. We've actually got pretty easily easy to add new types of toolbar items, so. Um, there's been work. One of the other things which has been worked on for GTK 2.4 is a new combo widget. So, presumably, we could set up a combo toolbar item, which for handling those sort of things, of a button button with a drop down next to it. Or we could use a hack similar to what's um, been used in uh, like Nautilus for its sort of uh, forward and backward buttons. Um, any any other questions?